My first real job was as a lab boy in a new technical college in Yule. And um, things were very, very different in those days. And it's wonderful to come around and see you still have burettes and flasks and all those other things. But perhaps I'm a little bit um, out of touch with some of the science. But I've tried to keep in touch. Also, I was very, very proud to be a guinea pig um, when uh, penicillin was being worked on. And um, I actually meant, uh, met the great man. And um, I had a very, very nasty abscess on this arm. You can still see the hole in it. And it had been there about two months. And my dad came home. He worked at Boots, a chemist. And he bought a, a, a glass cloche, the sort of thing you put um, uh, flowers in the garden. And we had a Bunsen burner on one side, and we had that blast, and we actually produced um, penicillin. And he put it in that hole on that, and two days later it was gone. Now, I'm not making that up. Um, and haven't things changed? Think the world we're now looking at these days. And if it wasn't still driven by real science, we wouldn't be here, um, you know, uh, doing the things we're doing. So it's my, um, well, I'm gobsmacked, but I'm actually here <laughs> talking to you. I'm an old man now, only 77, but nothing so far has fallen off yet. Um, <laughs> right, so the natural history of climate change and the way to live with it. And that is rehabilitation. And I rather like to think I'm an itinerant botanist because I go around the world. And I don't think I've ever done a day's work in my life. <laughs> because I, when I joined Durham University to lecture, I would get in and say, ladies and gentlemen, what will we talk about today? And we talk about just about anything. And then when the long vacation came, um, I'd take 40 of them in two really broken down old camper vans um, round Europe for a month. And for 22 years, it was like that. And then I don't really think it, well, it changed a bit. And I was the second per person in the world to get his picture on the front of nature. Okay, and the first person was Charles Darwin. I feel very big headed about this. And the picture, you can still see it, is a picture of me chasing a young lady in a, a, a grass skirt with a lawnmower. <laughs> and it said, science is fun. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's still fun. And if I press the right button, there. Now, if we had been sitting here only all 10,000 years ago, uh, the only premier game on view would have been mammoth hunting. And there were mammoths here um, in that time, and they were being slaughtered, and we've been already been shown um, one um, flint um, thing, and those were being here uh, used at that time. And um, the last ice age was coming to an end, or was it? We've just had the worst winter for, since 1963, and... Uh, it's a cycle. Well, I believe it's a cycle. So hooray for the cycles of natural climate change and ponder upon the fact that during that minuscule 10,000 years, um, all the brand of civilization has developed for better or for worse. <laughs> Which one's going to win tomorrow? Or is it denied? Um, we don't know. So. Science and politics are but two windows through which we can view the world and think about our dreams and our nightmares and about our futures. Without good science, we don't really have much of a future because there are six billion people on this earth and every day the soils of this earth has to produce 18 billion plates of food just to keep it going. And Walking around there and seeing all those things, I think we can do it. But are we heading in the right way? Back in those times, the Ice Age was coming to an end and um, none attacks started to pop out 
um, under the melting ice. And it was a pretty difficult place in which to live. The mammoths and things were uh, probably farther south as it began. <laughs> and global warming started, hooray, and these things began to melt. And there were very few things living on the ice, probably one species of plant. And as I'm a botanist, I'm very proud of that one species. And it was Chlamydomonas, hands up, all who you remember from bi biology, Chlamydomonas. Well, this is Nivea, and it is a wonderful Chlamydomonas, and it can have sex, well, sort of funny sex, and it waves its little arms about, and it really enjoys it. But living up on, <laughs> living up on the um, ice caps, um, there was really no water until global warming started melting it, and then this amazing thing, and because of the albedo there, um, it had to have a covering of, um, a, of a pigment, and that pigment was red, and that's why it leaves its carbon footprint all over the place, because it absorbs more energy, and therefore, and starts to melt. And you can still see um, up in the Arctic, and I spend lots of time up in the Arctic, and you can see this whole series um, still going on, melting and uh, re-melting, and uh, more and more species coming in. Now, this is just round the corn, corner of my house in, uh, on the top of um, uh, the Pennines. And just there, two... Um, uh, icebergs, the uh, ice caps came together and as they did they pushed a big lump of um, ice down and that became a kettle hole and anyone who, uh, any geologist will know what a kettle, kettle hole is, it, um, when the ice in it melted then it left a pond and that pond slowly but surely filled up with peat and I felt my whole, whole life crawling about in peat and eating it and doing all sorts of terrible things just to show uh, our student how important it is. <laughs> and you see how dirty the ice is. It's not wonderful blue stuff like down in the Antarctic. Um, this is land ice and all those, uh, that silt and stuff in there is of course full of nutrients. And I saw a wonderful um, gadget in the exhibition where they can take a drop of water and find out how much phosphate and all these things. I had, used to have to do it with a, a um, well, it didn't do it itself. It, you ha had to do it. So, you know, thank God for... Now, the other thing which was missing in that, the water was there, but of course water um, uh, you know, dissolves things. And the one thing that was missing was actually nitrogen. And nitrogen is a very, very important um, uh, part of the building block of life. And here we've got a melted area, and you'll see the wonderful black round the side. That is uh, nostoc, a blue-green alga, which can, and still does, um, fix nitrogen from the atmosphere and allowed other plants to come very, very quickly because most of the nitrogen nitrate had washed away and now they were being produced in a chemical factory, solar powered, of course. And then once you got the, nit the nitrates there, then wherever there was a little bit of shelter, because the wind was still very, very dry and blue across the top, then plants could think. And I, um, back in the days I was teaching at the university, could put names to every moss and liverwort in Britain. And it, this, and they are um, stone stripes, so a little bit of, um, of cover. And there are five species of moss and two species of flowering plant. And these are the